the age of 17, at the beginning of my senior year, I had one final, last altercation with my parents, as many a teenage girl does, and I uh, ran away from home. But since I already lived in the, in the epicenter of all things hip, you know, it's, this, is the, this is the mecca where people came, you know, it, there were the most, it's where artists came and musicians and poets and, and uh, all free-thinking, free-spirited people kind of were drawn to that very area. So I didn't see a need to run but about seven blocks away where I got a job as a mother's helper. Um, a family my best friend knew needed some help with their two little girls. And I feel, talk about God placing me somewhere. I really feel like God placed me in that particular home of all the places I could have ended up because the the couple had walls of incredible records. They were real music buffs, and they had floor-to-ceiling shelves with every kind of wonderful record. They had all of Louis Armstrong, all of all of Duke Ellington, all of Fletcher Henderson, and many, many jazz and blues artists. And I would just put the kids to bed, do my homework. They went out almost every night, and I would just start exploring all this wonderful music. And one night, I... I will never forget it. I came across the complete works of Bessie Smith on the original 78s. I had no idea who she was, but I just started going through them, and I came upon a, uh, the original 78 of Empty Bed Blues, part one and two. They were on two separate discs. And that piqued my interest, so I put that on, and the first minute I heard that, incredibly profoundly soulful voice come out of the speakers. It just stopped me dead in my tracks. I was blown away by the soul and and just depth of her expression. And uh, not to mention the words of the song, when the bed gets empty makes me feel awful mean and blue. My springs are getting rusty, sleeping single like I do. And you know, I just was transformed in that moment and I thought to myself this is what I want to do when I grow up I just was blown away you have to understand that at that time I mean all this folk music was going on in the neighborhood but the music that was coming over the radio airwaves was like Connie Francis and Patty Page singing how much is that doggy in the window so to hear something as soulful as Bessie Smith expressing herself from the very bottom of her heart and soul was quite a moment for me. So I started becoming interested in the blues and also it was interesting that I ended up on that particular street because right down the street was a little sandal shop called Allen Block Sandal Shop, and they had these like handmade, drawn to your foot sandals that I just coveted in the worst way. I wanted these Roman sandals that laced up. These were beatnik days, and this was just like the, the hippest of footwear at that time. So at a dollar a week, I was buying these sandals that he had made for me. And every Saturday, I'd go in and, uh, and pay him the dollar and uh, he would stop, it, it just so happened that on Saturday about two o'clock he stopped making sandals and started playing fiddle and a whole bunch of musicians would gather there and play old time music. And so for the first time, I had heard country and western, but this is the music that preceded country and western and preceded bluegrass and it's what we call old timey a Appalachian music. A lot of fiddles, mandolins, banjos, guitars, and people like um, the New Lost City Ramblers, uh, people like Mike Seeger and John Cohen used to come in there, and a lot of wonderful fiddlers, and just all kinds of musicians, and I fell in love with that music as well, so uh, he kindly said he'd show me a little bit on the fiddle, and uh, there was a, a group by the time I got out of high school, I was more and more involved with the, with the musical happenings around there, and there was a, a group called the Friends of Old Time Music that John Cohen and, and these people started, and they would go to the rural south and start looking for some of the original roots music 
artists that to us were just legends that we heard on these, these sort of through the mists of time on these scratchy old 78s or on these Smithsonian anthology collections. And uh, we found to our surprise that a lot of them were alive and quite well and still playing, if, if only on their front porch. They had been recorded in the, in the 20s and 30s, but here it was the early 60s and they were still alive and well, and uh, they started bringing them up north to concerts and presenting uh, this American roots music to audiences in the urban north. And, uh, and so I got, I was at every concert, and, um, and there was one that where they had Doc Watson and his family, Do, the, Do, I forget what it was called, the Doc Watson and the Watson family, and Clarence Ashley, and um, Doc Watson's father-in-law played beautiful, very simple, but very soulful fiddle, and I walked right up to him after the concert, and I was just blown away, and and uh, he he said, "Well, you come down to North Carolina, and I'll show you everything I know." And they were very gracious and hospitable, so I did end up taking a few trips down to Deep Gap, North Carolina, and stayed with them and learned to play a lot of old timey fiddle, and which for a girl growing up, in, a little Italian girl growing up in New York City, to be in the in the mountains of North Carolina, learning these gorgeous old traditional tunes with some of the best and most soulful musicians our country has ever, ha you know, produced. It was just a real gift for me. I'm really blessed that I was able to do that. So that's how my passion for music started. And it wasn't just the Watson family. Uh, we Every weekend there would be maybe a bluegrass concert in some little church basement or something. I, I got to see Flatt and Scruggs, the Stanley Brothers, the, Re, the Reno and Smiley, um, also a lot of blues artists, Mississippi John Hurt, Sun House, Skip James, Book of White, they were all there, just as close as I'm talking to you. And they were bringing back another time and place and something very, very soulful and universal that transcended anything that was just sort of a temporary trend on, on T pop radio. This this stuff was universal, very deep and wonderful stuff, and I became immersed in it.